So to model our basic crystal shape, we're going to take the default cube, cut it in half vertically and mirror the top to the bottom. Now, technically this is symmetrical across all axes, so we could, you know, cut it in X and Y as well, but it's actually going to be easier the way we're going to bevel it if we just mirror the bottom half. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tab into edit mode, use control R to add a loop cut, and then I'm going to add it vertically like this, then hit escape so it doesn't slide around, then grab the bottom four vertices and delete them out. Now we have half a cube, I'm going to go into the modifiers tab, search for a mirror modifier, set the axes to Z and turn on clipping. Now whatever I do to the top half will happen to the bottom half. I'm going to add an extrusion to the top and scale it inwards. This is essentially our crystal shape but there's one more step to do and that's just add our extra facets to this. So I'm going to shift alt click all four edge loops running upwards and then use control B to bevel them. Now this is almost correct but you can see at the top things start overlapping because the faces get too close together. So to do this I'm just going to click then go into the bevel menu in the bottom left, change the type from offset to percent and then slide that factor up to around 30%. In this way, the bevel depends on the width of the face that it's actually beveling and not by some global factor. So you can see by adding in a bevel modifier, what that does is essentially smooth out all the edges, but uh, the effect is way too strong at the minute. But if I turn it way down, it adds a really subtle effect that will look nice when we light it. And then what I'm going to do is just shade smooth on this, but you can see the shading slightly different to what we have when we shade flat. It shouldn't look that different for this model. So uh, what we need to do is add in a subdivision surface modifier to, to give this a bit more geometry so that the shading works a little bit better. So to do that, I'm just going to use the shortcut control two to add one at the end with two divisions. And if I go into edit mode, you can see the difference this makes. It just makes it more accurate when it comes to lighting and shading. One more thing I'm going to do before I go any further is just scale this down to a more real world scale because this will greatly affect how we shade this. So I'm just going to scale this object down until looking at the dimensions, it's about 10 to 20 centimeters tall. Then once I'm happy, I'm going to use control A and apply the scale. And what that does is just give us a bit more accuracy when we come to shade this with volumes and things like that. But you can see it changes the bevel width, so I'm just going to have to turn the offset way down again. You can actually type in measurements, so I'm going to type in one millimeter, and then I can also just divide that by some amount to make it even smaller just in the box. Now we're ready to take this into shading, I'm going to go into the shading tab, and I'm going to change the render engine to cycles. And the reason for this is because this material is fully refractive and reflective, and EV just doesn't handle that very well, it's going to look much better in cycles. The first thing I'm going to do is basically set this up as a glass shader. So to do that, I'm just going to turn the transmission way up to one and turn the roughness down to zero. Then I'm going to turn the IOR up to 1.9 and essentially what this does is just bend the light more as it goes through. And you can find these values online. So a crystal will have an IOR of around two with water 1.4 ish. So a crystal will bend light more than water will. Now the first thing I want to do is start adding some surface detail to this so it's not perfectly shiny. And to do this I'm going to grab some imperfection textures. And these are going to grab from um, Ambient CG. Uh, they're all CC0 textures, really high res, high quality stuff. And I'm just, I just grabbed this one that looks a little bit like rain or scratches and just some general imperfections that I can run across the surface of this model. So I'm going to grab the roughness and displacement map that's provided, set them both to a non-color. Then I'll plug the roughness into the roughness in the shader. To control the amount of roughness, I'm going to use a multiply in between. And if I turn on clamp, I'll, I can now set the value to something lower for a more shiny surface and something higher for a more rough surface. The displacement, 
I can't plug directly into the normal input, I have to run through a bump node and plug it into the height input to convert that colour output into a, a vector normal output. There's a slight problem in that the top faces don't have a UV map yet, so the texture is being stretched on those. So really simply what I'm going to do is just in edit mode select everything and hit U for UV unwrapping and Q project. And that will just auto UV unwrap this. And it's really useful for simple models like this to use cube projection. Now I'm just going to tweak the values on my bump and my roughness node until the crystal looks appealing. I want it to be quite shiny, quite transparent, but just have that, that surface detail breakup. Now in order to colour this crystal you might think you would just change the base colour and you can do that but that will change the colour of the reflections and it's more of a surface level effect. To get a more realistic result and a more physically accurate result I'm going to use a principled volume shader plugged into the volume output of the material. Now I'm going to leave the base colour as is and actually use the absorption colour to colour the crystal and that's just because the volume shader has two components the volume scatter component and the volume absorption component. The scattering component will make everything darker, the absorption component won't, basically. So, and then I'm going to turn the colour down on the top, just decrease the value uh, to reduce the amount of scattering in the crystal. We still want a little bit, but it can be much less than we want. And then I'll just turn the density way up to make the colour more prominent. And you might think we, you could just use a volume absorption node, but it actually gives you a little bit of a nicer result doing it this way. One thing you'll notice improves the shading on the crystals when using this principled volume node is under your um, scene render settings, if you go into light paths, turn the volume bounces up from 0 to 1 and you can see the difference that makes, it just lightens things up a little bit, it allows the light to scatter a bit more internally. Okay, so now I'm pretty happy with the shader, what I'm going to do is make a couple variations of this crystal because I now want to scatter them. So I want some that are a little bit taller, a little bit fatter, so I'm going to duplicate it up grab it and make a taller version here and also make a short stubbier version. If the bevel modifier starts behaving weirdly it stops beveling edges just decrease your angle. Now I'm going to set up just another basic scatter. This is the same as I do for anything grass, rocks, anything like that. I'm just going to add in a basic sphere Add a geometry nodes modifier and then move over to the geometry nodes tab and then in the node tree I'm going to distribute points on faces. I'm going to scale the sphere down in edit mode until it's more reasonable for the size of the crystals and I'm going to set the distribution from random to Poisson disk and what that will do is allow us to keep a minimum distance separation between the crystals so they don't overlap each other. And then I'm going to play with the density until there looks to be about the right amount of points. I'm going to place all these variations of crystals into their own collection. Then I'm going to use an instance on points node, drag in from the outline of the crystals collection, plug it into the instances. and turn on pick instance, separate children, and reset children. Now you'll see the problem is that they're not rotated uh, in line with the sphere, so to fix this I'm just going to plug the rotation output from the distribute points node into the rotation of the instance on points node. Now you'll see we're missing the base sphere because it's all been converted into these crystal instances, so I just need to rejoin it at the end. So I'll just add in the join geometry and plug in the input from the node group. Now to introduce some more randomness to this, what I'm going to do is randomize the rotation slightly. I'm going to use a rotate rotation node in between 
uh, where I've plugged it in. You can see as I play with the values, everything starts to move, but it actually moves globally. And what we want is it to move based on its individual axes. So I'll set the, set the rotation to local. And now what I can do is sort of spin the crystals about their axes, which I couldn't do before. Now in order to randomize the rotation, I'm gonna add in a random value node set to vector. And that's just because we need three values for the rotation to randomize it in all three dimensions. Now to start with, I'm just gonna plug this in and set the max to be zero, and then just slowly start increasing the value until I get some nice looking random rotation. I'm also going to scale the sphere down a bit in edit mode just because I think it looks nicer when the crystals are a bit bigger relatively. Now the other thing I want to do is randomize the length of the crystals slightly even more than we currently have with the instances. So I'm going to duplicate this random value node, plug it into the scale and then set everything, set the minimum max to be one and then slowly start increasing the max scale and decreasing the min scale on the Z component. And that will just vary the length slightly. You can also play with varying the scale on the X and Y as well, but I would recommend doing this much less. Once you're happy with your scatter, I'm going back into the layout tab and I'm gonna start lighting and rendering this. Now I added in an area light and rotated and positioned it just slightly uh, perpendicular to where I wanted my camera to be and turned up the, the strength of the light till it looked about correct. So to start with, I'm gonna actually give the sphere that we're scattering on a base material that's a bit darker so that we don't get all this white bounce light coming up. And then to position the camera, I'm gonna use control alt number pad zero where I, while in the 3D view having the camera where I want it to be positioned. And then if I want to tweak the camera position, I can just grab it and use G. Now what I was realizing is that the, the scatter was looking a little bit sparse, so I was seeing a bit too much of the sphere. So I went back into the geometry nodes tab and just up the density until those holes were filled in. I was pretty happy with how this was looking. So my next step was to turn on some depth of field for the camera to get a nicer render. So under the camera settings on this little green icon, you can turn on depth of field and then either set the distance manually. But what I like to do is add in an empty object, I rename it to be F for focus. And then I just set the focus object to be that empty. Now, wherever I position that empty will be the point that is in focus. Then I'll decrease the f-stop value to 1.4 and that's a physical value based on camera lenses. And then another thing that I like to do to make things pop a little bit more without having to do it all in lighting is under the color management tab change the contrast to very high for this render in particular. It just helps makes the crystals pop a little bit more and gets a lot of contrast in there. Now in order to light this a little bit nicer, what I'm going to do is just add in a rim light behind the scene. So sort of in line with the camera pointing towards us. And you can see what that does is just catch the edge of the crystals in quite a nice way, makes them pop a little bit more from the background. And then the bottom right of my image was looking a little bit dark. So what I did was just duplicate the light again, bring it round to light that area, just make it a little bit larger in size and a little bit less strong, just a little bit of fill light. And in order to get a better sense of the values, I turned on transparent film so I wasn't looking at the value change in the background. And also what I like to do is use the world light as a fill. This will sort of globally ambiently light everything. So I just turned the strength back up from zero. And you could also use the color, the brighter you make it, the lighter things will be. Then all that was left to do was let it render for a little while. It is quite a slow render because there's obviously a lot of depth of field, a lot of uh, volume scattering and that kind of thing happening. 
yeah, hopefully you learnt something about shading in that tutorial. It's these basic techniques I use for pretty much everything I shade. And a crystal is quite an interesting subject because it's quite volume heavy and it also has some nice surface detail going on. You could definitely do um, a more complex shader, but this is quite simple and hopefully it gives you a good idea.